Hello and welcome to the first ever live stream event from our ANTIS academic program. Uh, I'm so happy that you decided to join us today. Uh, those of you in person here at UC San Diego in the Envision Maker Studio and, and those uh, around the world on YouTube. Uh, thank you for joining. I really hope there's, there's going to be something uh, interesting here for you. And, uh, I'm getting a message in the room that you can't hear me, so if I'm yelling on YouTube, I'm sorry. <laughs> But, uh, but welcome. So today we're going over how simulation is used in the electric vehicle ecosystem, really. It's not just the cars, it's, it's, uh, it's wireless charging, it's um, you know, really a lot, of, a lot of complex engineering goes into these systems, and the way to manage it is through simulation. So uh, first, as, a, as just a, we, we have to say this, I mean, it's, it's really, we're in an amazing space today, we're in the Envision Maker Studio, and uh, we got a big, a big shout out and thank you to the staff here who've uh, done a huge help for us. The IT services here, as well as uh, the uh, audio visual we have. You know, if you notice we've got a live stream set up. So that's a, that's a first for us and we're really happy to be doing that. So by the end of the day, my hope is that you've learned three things and these three topics kind of permeate throughout today's lecture. Uh, it's, Simulation is leveraged throughout the ecosystem of electric vehicles, from researchers to, to huge companies, and especially, you know, you may have noticed a lot of EV startups. S learning simulation while you're a student is an incredibly attainable goal. It is, the technology has come so far that you can do in incredibly complex things in a simple way, and by the end of the day, you'll actually see our technology work, and you'll be able to understand how it works. So. Um, well, one of the ideas as well, and probably the most important, is that if you do take the time to really learn this technology and, and even just the basics of it, that is going to help you launch your career. So we have four different workshops, and we'll be back in this room again within the, over the next two weeks. Today we're covering electric vehicles, but there is so much more to ANSYS, so we thought two hours at one time, that's not enough. So we're doing, we're doing four separate sections one on fluid mechanics, one on structural simulation, and one on autonomous vehicle systems. So why are we doing this? You know, why is ANSYS taking so much time to, to really invest in the next generation of students and, and making sure everyone knows our technology in school? I'm going to show you a quick video, and that'll, that'll hopefully answer that question. Let us help you, let us show you, and 
once in my case, we we'll use to make improvements. The benefits of simulation are ultimately saving money. You can do so much more in, inside the computer than we ever could inside the test. I think the key for ANSYS in the future of online simulation is they have a very deep portfolio of tools that are ever growing, whether it's the, the sales people, the technical support people, or the developers that uh, ANSYS are always open. They want to learn more about what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And that's why the partnership is so strong. For the future, there will clearly be more and more modeling simulation. And we're already looking at how we go to universities and hire graduates in you know, modeling simulation rather than classical subjects. We're going to see more and more designers uh, doing analysis. We're going to offer training with their companies to do that. So really, I think simulation throughout the organization, we're going to see more people either building models or running models, or at a minimum, using tools to allow them to look at the results and make uh, very important decisions. I feel like we've just cracked the door open. I look forward to what's going to happen and how we're going to work with that system. All right. Well, if that wasn't crystal clear, you know, I don't know what is. C Cummins is telling you directly, we need to hire more engineers who know simulation straight out of school. So in, in class, you may not learn these, these materials, but it's incredibly easy to learn them as students. So that's the goal of today, right? Let's show you what you can do with simulation, and let's show you how easy it is to do it, right? Um, just from taking a survey from our most innovative customer, we, we learned the following. You know, in 2025, every engineer will touch simulation in some way. Um, you know, it's, it, maybe they're not all analysts, but they need to understand how simulation works and how much you can trust it in any given situation. Uh, you may just be handed results, you may be asked to do a quick simulation, or maybe it's your full-time job, right? So what are we talking about today? We're, we're talking about a specific area of simulation that's just you know, kind of product development and the kind of simulations you would do in that area. Uh, but there's so much more. ANSYS is a product uh, that's used throughout the, the life cycle of, of most commercial goods, right? You can use it uh, for development, but also throughout manufacturing, operations, uh, even in the design, like the ideation point where you'd be drawing on the napkin, the, just the, the oh, I have this kind of weird idea, right? We have tools that help with that. And what's, what's even more innovative is in the product, when it's operating, there are tools to help with that as well. Um, those involved with the digital twin world. So, you know, today, like I said, we're just focusing on that item, the design, the design of the product. So, uh, uh, furthermore, you know, we're used in every simulation, in every, uh, in every industry, right? So we're, we're focusing on the electromagnetic simulation tools that we, that we offer, specifically the lower frequency range, so power electronics, motors, actuators, solenoids, and complete power systems. So that all, that all permeates all of these industries. However, you know, specifically today, we thought, what's a cool way to talk about low frequency simulation? It's electric vehicles. I think most of you are interested in that, and that's what... You know, that's what we're going to get to. Before we jump into the EV side of things, uh, I'm going to show you a few academic resources that you should know about. You know, if you really decide that you want to do more, more simulation with these tools, uh, how do you learn them? I'm going to cover a couple slides on that. Then we'll pass it over uh, to, to my colleague who will jump into the technical stuff. So ANSYS has uh, a huge variety of tools, uh, from, from fluid mechanics to mechanical, to semiconductor, mission critical embedded software, but you know we're focusing on the electromagnetic suite. So many of you are probably part of student teams. Uh, can I get a show of hands to the people in the room if you're part of a student team? All right, awesome. We have, we have a, I saw, saw a few hands there. So uh, for race car teams, Hyperloop, uh, all that kind of, uh, any competitive team, if you're building something, solar car, whatever, if, it's, if you're in a competition, you know, ANSYS, we love to sponsor student teams. We sponsor, you know, 400, uh, you know, at, at a minimum every year. And uh, you can take a look at some of, the, some of the simulations that the students have done. They, they regularly blow people's minds. If they, they say, you can't do that as an undergrad student, but you absolutely can. Um, so, and then we also notice the student teams who do simulation, they end up winning. Um, and companies want to hire those winning engineers. So we end up helping a lot of students get jobs. So if you get to know simulation, you know, keep in touch with us. You know, if you're in contact with your local ANSYS representative, 
let us know when you graduate. We'd love to help you find a job. These are just a couple of uh, you know, recent publications about this where companies are saying, you know, we no longer recruit the normal way, right? We hire student teams. So if you, love, if you end up really enjoying this seminar and you want to do more with Maxwell, a good resource is from Arizona State University with uh, uh, the tutor tutorials are online. You just Google the phrase air-x simulation. You can get a, a few tutorials there. We also have a variety of tutorials on our YouTube channel, uh, but it's not just ANSYS. You know, we have, we have partners who have YouTube channels. They have a lot of good material, Simutech and PADT. You just search for the term hashtag learn ANSYS and you'll, you'll find a, a huge amount of resources. We even have crazy fans on YouTube who are making, who are making videos. Uh, this, this engineer is actually a PhD from UBC and uh, his, his name's Kamyar K. That's the name of his YouTube channel. Highly recommend you guys check it out. He has over 148 tutorials that are specifically for ANSYS Maxwell, right? The stuff that you're going to see today, the, elect the low frequency electromagnetic for developing motors, but, but also a lot more. Furthermore, this guy actually answers questions. So if you open up one of his videos, I highly recommend take a look at the comments because he's answering questions. So we also have a student community. If you have a question and you can't get an answer from Kamyar or you, know, you, just, you want to answer quicker, type it in on our student community. Well, you know, we have all of our engineers on there on a regular basis answering questions. So you know, post your question there. You may hear from us. You may hear from one of your colleagues or someone around the world who just happens to have the same problem and knows how to fix it. So I get this question every time I go to campus. How do I access ANSYS? Well, if you're, if you're um, on a four-year university campus, there's a very high probability your school actually has you know, uh, a, a license of ANSYS that you can use. Uh, you know, if that doesn't work, so talk to your, first talk to your professor or IT, and if that doesn't work, talk to, uh, talk to us. See if you can get your student team sponsored. Right? We love to sponsor student teams. Please reach out to us. Um, if you are interested in doing mechanical simulation or fluid simulation, we have a free student product at ansys.com slash student. So check it out there. And uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. If you need ANSYS and none of those things worked, we, we are happy to work with you. Let us know what you need to do and why you need to do it, and, and we'll do our best. Uh, lastly, my contact is here, is here. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I hope I don't get too many uh, complicated questions, but I'm always happy to help where I can. All right, so I do you know, academic program management for ANSYS on North America West, so I, do, I don't answer technical questions, but if you have some other question, I'm happy to help. So we're going to pass the torch now to my colleague, um, Pavani Godapati, who is a, just a world-class engineer. She has a PhD in electrical engineering from Louisiana State University. Um, Furthermore, a background in electric motor simulation. She uh, has years of experience at ANSYS. I believe she's on her seventh year. So she knows really everything there is to know about this stuff. So I really hope she's, she's going to give you a lot of value today. Um, and I'll pop in at the end to say goodbye. But for now, enjoy. And thank you for taking the time to learn about ANSYS. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining, and thank you, Jacob. So uh, we'll be talking about electric vehicle simulation this evening um, and how we can use Maxwell to aid in your simulation goals. And before going into the electric vehicles itself, we'll talk a little bit about what is finite element analysis? Why do we need to do it? Why do we need simulation in the first place? And then what benefits can it provide? Um, and we'll explore what are the, all the applications that can be modeled in Maxwell before going into electric vehicles in detail. So for the electric vehicles part, so this is my agenda here today. Um, and for the electric vehicles part, um, I have a detailed demo on electric mo motors. So we'll dig into some details on using Maxwell and Autumn Expert for electric machine design. And we'll talk a little bit more about wireless charging um, as time permits. So let's talk a little bit about finite element analysis. 
So what is finite element analysis? It's a numerical way of solving things. It's basically, there are two approaches to solving a problem. You can solve a problem using equations, which is the traditional analytical method. Uh, but what if it gets complex? What if you have nonlinearities? What if it is not a traditional problem? You're trying to think out of the box and have a unique design. And in that case, you would rely on physics-based approaches or the finite element approaches. So if we look at the types of analysis approaches here, we have analytical here and numerical techniques. And in numerical techniques, we can use integral equations or differential equations. And that is what is Maxwell based on is the differential equations here. And you can use finite different or finite elements. And um, so Maxwell also comes with both 2D and 3D modelers. And what are we basically solving using finite element approaches? We are solving the basic field quantities. We are trying to get the vector potentials or scalar potentials, the B fields and H fields. And from there, we derive the quantities that we need. So let's say if you need the force um, between a magnet and some steel shunt. So how do you compute the force? You first compute the B field, and that is what the finite element uh, solver does. It computes the uh, basic fields and derives the rest of the quantities, like forces, for example, from, from the basic quantities like the B field and H field, J field, and so on. So when we talk about finite element, a crucial part of finite element analysis is meshing. That's an integral step to the finite element analysis. So what is a mesh? So what we do is basically we take a problem. We basically uh, break down the problem into smaller elements. Or in this case, with Maxwell, that element type is a tetrahedron, like you see here on the slide. And we basically solve for the fields within the tetrahedron. And so now the entire solution domain consists of hundreds of tetrahedron or thousands of tetrahedrons. And we integrate the fields from each tetrahedron to get uh, the full solution for the entire problem. So um, in Maxwell, in what Maxwell does is it takes this tetrahedron, it solves for the fields at the nodes of the tetrahedron and the midpoints of the edges. And then it basically um, uh, integrates the solution from each tetrahedron and gives you the final solution. So uh, there are two approaches as well to solve the matrix. So it basically compiles a matrix out of all the tetrahedrons. And it can use a direct solver approach or an iterative solver approach to arrive at the solution. And Maxwell supports both approaches. Um, Iterative solver is a useful approach. It's based on the best guess method. And it's a useful approach if you have a very a large problem that needs a lot of memory requirement, then um, that can help you to reduce the memory requirement as well. And um, with, with finite element analysis, there are a few crucial steps. Meshing is an integral part, as I mentioned earlier. And what Maxwell does is it basically automates the solution process. It creates an initial mesh automatically, and then it, it basically runs the problem. So what I mentioned a little bit earlier on the previous slide, breaking down the solution into multiple tetrahedrons, solving for fields at each node at the midpoints of the edges of the tetrahedron, you do not have to do it. The software does it for you. The tool does it for you. So um, it's very intuitive to use. It's easy to set up the problem. And you can basically focus your time on analyzing the results or basically optimizing your design instead of worrying about, am I having the right mesh? Am I doing it the right way or not? So um, what is a mesh? And uh, when, we, when I mentioned about the mesh, we, I talked about the tetrahedrons. So how is this basically used in the solution process? So basically, um, when we input a geometry, the input to a finite element tool is a geometry and the material properties. So let's say once we input the geometry, it breaks down the geometry in the background into these tetrahedrons. It basically generates an initial mesh. That is the initial meshing stage. It computes the field. 
And as a user, you can say, I want an accuracy of 99% uh, in my solution, or my error should not exceed 1% in the solution. So that's what, as a user, you would input to the tool that a, an error more than 1% is not acceptable to me. So once it generated the initial mesh, it basically looks at this error percentage, and then it sees, oh, the error is higher than 1%. So what it does is it goes back, it refines the mesh. It finds the mesh elements where the energy error is high. It adds more mesh elements in those areas. It refines the mesh. So this is all automated in the background. You do not have to worry about refining the mesh or uh, um, achieving convergence. So once it refines the mesh, it computes the fields again. Then it looks for the error again. Is the error exceeding? If it exceeds the error, then it goes back again, refines the mesh. So it continues this uh, process until the convergence is reached, until the accuracy that you need is achieved. So we talked about meshing and finite elements. It's a little bit too abstract, perhaps. And as an engineer, you would probably want to uh, focus on what are your goals, what do you want the tool to give you. Are you looking to compute the forces? Are you looking to compute the inductances? Or are you looking to compute the uh, current density distribution? So that is what you'd want to, the tool to give you. And, that is, and basically, these are derived from the fields, the magnetic flux densities, the magnetic field intensities, the current density distribution. Basically, um, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell's equations are solved in the background to give you these forces or inductances or losses. So, um, and in this solution process, Maxwell also saves the solution in the entire solution profile, in the, in the entire solution domain. So if you want to post-process the results in a certain way, maybe, um, let's say, you're modeling a coil and you have a hall sensor somewhere where the sensor gets triggered once the field exceeds a certain threshold. So you want to extract the field where the sensor is placed. And in Maxwell, you can basically do that. You can basically add a dummy box, a dummy container, and you can say, OK, this is where I need the field. So our, basically, you want to place your sensor in an optimal location. So you, want to, you can extract the field distribution throughout the entire solution domain. And find an optimal location on where to place your sensor around that coil. So an introduction to Maxwell. Maxwell comes with both 2D and 3D modelers. Um, you may have a question about why do I need 2D? I can do a 3D simulation. I can input my geometry into 3D. So it depends on your geometry and the physics that you're looking to model. If you have a symmetric geometry, you can do it in 2D. If your geometry has a symmetry into the page direction, it can be extruded in a direction. You can just take a slice of it and model it in 2D. And we'll be talking a little bit more in, in the next few slides. And Maxwell also is based on automatic and adaptive meshing. So you don't have to worry about creating the mesh or um, how it would influence your solution. It would automatically uh, generate this mesh and refine it to reach the accuracy that you need. And what are the outputs for Maxwell? You can compute forces, rotational torques. You can compute um, losses, eddy current losses, core losses, like magnetic losses or hysteresis losses. You can compute um, time-induced effects, like magnetic diffusion. Um, you can model saturation. So if you have transformers or inductors, and you may want to see, OK, what if you increase the current in the coil below it um, ahead of certain threshold, how will the core saturate? If the core saturates, that will influence the performance of the device. Ideally, you would not want the core to saturate. So those kind of things can be modeled in Maxwell. Um, you can obtain field solutions. You can plot uh, the magnetic flux density, the current density, the electric potential, the E field um, throughout the solution space. And also, there is a capability to model materials. Maxwell comes with its own material library, so there are several vendor libraries for permanent magnets and steels. 
but if you're using a custom material, you could also input that material into Maxwell and create your own custom material library as well. And most often when you design a component, you would want to optimize it. So you may want to see, what if I reduce my core size? What if I have 10 turns instead of 20 turns? How would my results change? So Maxwell also provides you the capability to parameterize any design variation. You can say that instead of, if you're modeling a magnet, you can say, okay, this magnet uh, thickness is a variable instead of a constant number. You can sweep that variable through a range and you can see how the results change with that parameter change. And you can also do goal-driven based optimization. So you can say that uh, my goal is to achieve a target uh, force of 40 newtons. And, and these are my input variables. I want to change the air gap and tell me for what air, air gap value I can get this 40 newtons. So you can do goal, automate that goal-driven based optimization studies. And most importantly, when you design your component, it's more likely going into a system. So if you have a motor, uh, maybe this motor is, an, is in a fan or it's in an um, electric vehicle, so, which is basically driven by an electric drive. There is certain other mechanical load or an electrical load interacting with this motor. And you can, you can basically model those loads with the motor. So Maxwell can also give you a reduced order model to plug into a system simulation. And also, um, it can couple with other ANSYS tools like mechanical or CFD. So if you are looking to do thermal analysis or structural analysis, you can couple Maxwell with the other ANSYS tools and do a multi-physics coupled simulation as well. So um, it looks like there is a problem with my animation here, but what you can see here is the mesh process on this flowchart here. And then um, what is not shown in this picture is on the center leg of the core, there is a winding, uh, which is not shown in this picture. And when the coil is energized, there is a force generated by the structure. So on the right-hand side, on the very right, there are some red curves and a blue curve. The blue curve is a measured force versus current curve. So if you increase the coil current, the force will increase. Um, and the red curves are the simulated values. So when the mesh is coarse, the simulated values are far off from the measured values. But with automatic meshing, um, the mesh density is automatically increased. And you can see that at the end, basically, the red curve overlaps with the blue curve. Uh, very close to the blue curve. So basically you can achieve a good agreement between the simulated and measured values. So uh, in Maxwell, how can I use Maxwell? What should I use Maxwell for? Is there an application that I can benefit from? Um, so Maxwell comes with different solvers. Um, you can broadly classify them as electric or magnetic solvers. Um, again. I would say the most often used is the magnetostatic solver. Magnetostatic solver is used for basically modeling uh, DC currents or DC forces. So if you have permanent magnets and you want to look at the force exerted by the permanent magnet on some steel shunt, you can model that using permanent magnet. You can also model coils. If you have a coil and it carries some DC current, then you can model that as well in Maxwell and look at the uh, flux generated by the coil uh, using the magnetostatic solver. And you can compute forces, inductances, um, the field distribution, all of those in the magnetostatic. And then there is the eddy current solver, which is the frequency domain solver in Maxwell. And the eddy current solver is typically used for AC problems. If you have a sinusoidal current, let's say you have a coil and it carries some sinusoidal current. And this sinusoidal current, uh, it goes from a frequency, let's say, near DC all the way to a few hundred kilohertz or a megahertz, perhaps. And you want to model the skin depth effects at higher frequencies, or you want to model induced eddy effects. So maybe you have some other, let's say, conductive steel structure near this um, coil, 
and at high frequencies, this coil will generate a magnetic flux, which will induce a current in that conductive plate. And that can be modeled using the eddy current solver, so anything to deal with induced eddy effects or proximity effects um, in frequency domain that can be modeled in the eddy current solver. Some typical applications um, for in eddy current problems are induction heating. So if you have seen an induction cooktop uh, where there is a coil and that generates some eddy current, which heats up that cooktop. So those are some of the problems, um, like induction heating, for example. You can model them in eddy current solver. Um, or transformers or inductors if you're, if you're basically looking at high, high frequency ones. And um, also, also that one, one other solver that falls into the magnetic categories is the transient magnetic solver, which is a time domain solver in Maxwell. So um, if you have a non-sinusoidal current, maybe a trapezoidal or a square wave or some arbitrary current versus time profile that you got from a spice tool, let's say, and you want to model that in Maxwell. You, so the transient magnetic solver gives you the ability to model any arbitrary excitation time domain profile, and it also gives you the ability to model motion. So if you have a motor which rotates at, let's say, 1,000 RPM, or if you have an actuator, which basically a linear actuator, um, and it basically closes at certain speed. So you can basically impose speed terms or velocity terms in um, the transient magnetic solver and model that in the uh, model those dynamic problems in the transient magnetic solvers. On the second um, side of things, there are the electric solvers. If you are looking to solve for electric fields, capacitances, then you can use the electrostatic solver or the DC conduction solver is typically used for current flow problems. So um, let's say you have a PCB and there is a source and there is a sink, and between the source and sink, the current traces run between different layers. You want to see how the current density is distributed. You can use the um, DC conduction solver for those cases, or the transient electric solver um, where you can model any arbitrary time varying current or voltage in time and look at the electric fields in time domain. So here is a slide on um, difference between 2D and 3D simulations. Um, again, Maxwell comes with both 2D and 3D modelers. You can start with a 2D and then you can later decide to go on to 3D. Um, typically, in, in this case here, um, on the slide on the left top corner, we can see a motor uh, picture here where you can see that you can take a cross section along a plane and you can model it as a 2D problem. Or um, there is a rotational symmetry on the bottom one, so there is a, let's say, a transformer with two windings, and there is a rotational symmetry, so you can model that in 2D as well. So 2D modeler has two types. There is a XY plane symmetry, so if you can extrude a model then you can take a cross section and model in the XY plane, or an axial symmetry. If you have an axial symmetry, um, and let's say you can rotate this 2D cross section around an axis to generate the 3D model, then you can use the 2D as well. So the advantage with using 2D is that it solves, it, the problem size is much smaller in 2D versus 3D, so you are solving it with much faster, uh, in much smaller time, and with less memory as well. And it's very helpful if you are in an initial design stage where you are trying to um, change the dimensions and look at the performance. Then you can easily run hundreds of variations in 2D quickly, find an optimal design that fits your needs, and then do an in-depth 3D analysis uh, if you need to do it as well. So if you are looking to initial stages of your design and if you are looking to change some parameter values, then you can set up those automatic suites using 2D, run those analysis faster and get the resource. And one other uh, concept that can also help to reduce your simulation time is modeling symmetries. Sometimes um, you may see that your structure may be symmetric. On the right hand side, you can see there is a 
uh, transformer, for example, and, or an inductor, and there are two windings there in red and green. And if you basically slice it into half, it can be a half symmetry. But again, in this case, you can just model a quarter of the model. So you can just take one fourth of the model, uh, slide, slice it two way, and then just model one fourth uh, in 3D. Or um, for periodic structures like motors, typically there will be periodicity in the fields, and you can just model a portion of the motor as well. It may be one fourth of the model, or even just a 30 degree slice of the motor can be modeled as well if there is periodicity. So this again will help up, help you to um, increase the simulation uh, speed and also reduce the memory consumption. Some other approaches to model, um, also in this case here, uh, we have a coil example. So what is shown here, the gray, po the gray piece in this uh, picture is a core, a magnetic core, and the ones in green are basically coils. So on the far uh, left here, we can see that in the transformer core, we have eight turns of copper. So eight separate turns and it may be carrying one ampere each. But you can simplify that. If you are basically just looking to calculate the inductance of that winding, you do not have to model each turn of the coil separately. Instead, you can just model a lumped coil, which is what is shown in the second uh, picture there in the middle. Um, instead of modeling four turns on each layer, you can just model two layers, and you can basically now assign uh, four amp turns each in one layer. Uh, or you can further simplify it and you can just model one big chunk of coil and you can say tot it's, it carry, carries a total of eight ampere turns each. So if you are looking for a field solution, like a magnetic flux density, it does not matter if you have eight turns and one ampere each or if you have two turns and four ampere turns each or if you have just one turn and, if, uh, and carries eight ampere turns. All the three cases will provide you with the same field solution. So um, only case where you may want to model these individual terms is if you are looking to model eddy effects in frequency domain. So let's say these coils carry some sinusoidal current at some high frequencies. And at that high frequency, due to skin and eddy effects, the current does not penetrate through the volume of the conductor. In that case, you can just model um, in that case, you can model each turn individually. And this approach is particularly encouraged for 3D models. Again, uh, for 3D models, you can basically imagine that um, the problem size is much larger than 2D, and it definitely helps when you are basically modeling a lumped coil in 3D. And to account for the number of turns, if you are calculating inductance, you can basically assign a post-processing parameter the, and account for the number of turns in the mutual and self-inductances. And also one other big advantage with this approach is if you are extracting a reduced order model or an equivalent circuit model from the finite element tool, you are dealing with a much smaller problem size at the system level. So on the bottom here, you can see a picture of a system level. So let's say this coil now, you are extracting it to, into a circuit simulator. Uh, when you are modeling, let's say, 105 turns, each one of them individually, right? now you have two pins for each turn. So that would lead to 210 terminals in your circuit simulator. Whereas with the lump coil, it's much simpler. You just have two pins that you can connect to the rest of the system. And uh, that is about the coil modeling. One other um, important aspect that comes up with uh, finite element analysis, particularly with electromagnetics, is material modeling. So um, with magnetic fields, again, material can saturate. So if you have a transformer core or an inductor core, um, and in this case here, there is a laminated core that is shown here. And this core has certain mag magnetic permeability, so which defines how the core contains the magnetic flux density. 
So um, in Maxwell comes with, it, with its own material library where the BH curves are all defined. Or if you have a custom material, you can define your own material property as well. And what, let's, if you imagine that on this core, now there is a coil around the center leg. And let's say now the coil is energized. And when the coil is energized, you can see that the magnetic domains will get aligned and the core gets magnetized. So it basically tracks a BH curve. Um, and that is what is shown here on the BH curve hysteresis loop on the right. So basically in Maxwell, you can model saturation. So you can make the current as a variable. As you increase the current, you can see how the core gets magnetized. And you can also, there is also an option to model demagnetization or remanence. So if you're modeling actuators, for example, and or solenoids, where basically the coil is energized for a few milliseconds. And then once you take the current off, once you turn off the coil, the core does not get back to its initial state. There is some remnant field in the core. And in Maxwell, you can basically also account for those remnant fields as well and see if there is any remnant forces caused by the uh, remnant B field. And here is a very simple example to get you started uh, with Maxwell, for example. What is shown in this picture, the gray portion is a core, and the green portion is a coil wound around the core. And there is a light blue air gap in that core. So this is a simple inductor. And when you energize the coil, you can use your right hand thumb rule, for example. And if you put a current in the coil, you can imagine that there is a flux density from that coil because of the current. And that now that flux density basically goes, it basically tracks the core because there is, it is a magnetic material. So you can replace that coil if you were to create an equivalent circuit, right? You can replace that coil with a voltage or a current source. And the core has some resistance, which is represented as a resistor in that circuit. And the air gap has some resistance too, which is represented as another resistance in that circuit. So now, um, as you increase the current, there is some flux linkage. And so there is an inductance for the coil. This is an inductor. And the purpose of the inductor is to store the magnetic energy. So that magnetic energy, we are basically uh, measuring it in terms of inductance. So we can, you can compute the inductance from Maxwell. On this uh, picture here, you can see there is a red curve here, which is the inductance computed by Maxwell. And if you compute the inductance using this magnetic circuit approach, you can see that these results are very close to each other. And in this case, the core is a linear core. You can see the permeability is a constant number at 4,000. So it's much easier to use an analytical approach as well because it's known, it's a linear material, it's much linear problem. But let's say if your core is nonlinear, then, uh, then it can get a little bit more complex because the operating point is not moving linearly, but it gets saturated after a while. So uh, that can be modeled using Maxwell. And as engineers, typically we look for inductance from the simulation. When we are modeling coils, we want to basically get the inductance. Um, and inductance can be derived from the flux linkage. So if you take the flux linkage generated by the coil, divided by the current in the coil, that is what is inductance is. And Maxwell can basically solve for that, and it will give you what is the inductance number. So it can, it can give you the self-inductance of the coil. It's much simpler if you have just one coil. Now let's say you have multiple coils, or three coils like in this case. Then you get a three by three inductance matrix. You have a self-inductance of each coil, then each coil basically cross-couples the magnetic flux, so there is a mutual inductance between the coils. And that can be, Maxwell also reports that mutual inductance, the mutual coupling between the coils. And because of this inductance now, um, and because of the time-changing current, there can be an induced voltage in the wire. So in this picture here, let's say we have a current-carrying conductor in pink, which is shown in the pink uh, picture there. 
So we apply some current, and because of the flux linkage, there is some induced voltage in the, in the current carrying conductor. So Maxwell can be used to compute those induced voltages. Uh, typically, you would look at these induced voltages, for example, in motors, which is what we call as back EMF. So Maxwell can also give you those parameters as well. So what we are doing here is we are extracting the inductances, the self-inductances, the mutual inductances in the system. And we can build a simple system here which can characterize the system. So if you give a known input to the system, now you know the inductances, the resistances, and you can expect the output. You, you would know how the system would respond to any given input. Um, so that is what we are extracting from Maxwell, is we are basically extracting how this system performs um, at a given input. And let's go in a little bit into the applications. Um, what can we use Maxwell for? So, Basic things, um, if you're modeling permanent magnets, you can use Maxwell for that. You can use Maxwell for coils. You can use Maxwell to extract forces, rotational torques, inductances. In terms of application, in terms of real world, what would be the applications? So if you're modeling actuators, for example, linear or rotational actuators, or switches, contact switches, then you can use Maxwell for those to calculate the force. Um, sorry. And you can use Maxwell for electric machines like motors or generators. And you can use it for uh, power system design like cables, if you have cables and you want to extract the parasitics of the cable. Or um, you, if you have wireless charging devices and you want to see the mutual coupling, the efficiency of the wireless charging device, you can use Maxwell for those. Or some other biomedical applications like uh, MRI coil, for example, and if you have an implant inside an MRI coil, so um, how does that implant uh, respond to the flux from the MRI coil? And going a little bit more into electric machines, um, motors, you can use Maxwell to design the motor, and Maxwell can be used for different types of motors. It can be a permanent magnet motor, an induction motor, um, or let's say stepper motor, switch reluctance motor, so axial flux or radial flux machines. So all of them can be modeled using Maxwell. And that one other tool that helps in this motor design process is a tool called RM Expert, which is an analytical tool for machine design. And it can basically um, plug the model into Maxwell 3D as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in the next slides. But the outputs from Maxwell for machines, so you want the motor to deliver certain torque, certain power. So you can, Maxwell can predict those. It will tell you what is the torque from the motor, what is the output power from the motor. Um, it can also give you the loss of the machine. So if the machine gets too hot, it's likely to break down. So it can give you the loss distribution in the motor. And what you can do further is you can plug this loss from Maxwell into ANSYS thermal to look at the temperature distribution. And Maxwell will compute the forces. You can plug that force um, into ANSYS structural to look at deformation or acoustics or noise or do a NVH analysis. And um, what more is that this motor is most likely driven by an electric drive. And it's intended for a purpose. It goes into an electric vehicle, for example, where it interacts with certain other loads, maybe a battery, or certain driving conditions are imposed on it. So you can model, take a reduced order of this model um, into simpler, build the rest of your drive and the loads around it, and do an entire system level simulation um, using ANSYS simpler. OK, next one here is actuators or solenoids. So actuators or solenoids are typically used to deliver a certain force or a torque. So um, it's an actuating device to close or open, for example, a valve. You can simply imagine it as a valve that closes or open. But this valve is now energized by a coil, um, an electromagnetic coil. So when you energize a the coil, there is a force delivered, and the actuator closes, let's say. 
So that can be modeled using Maxwell. Um, you can optimize it too. Another application area is sensors. So if you are modeling hall sensors, or um, let's say variable reluctance sensors, eddy current sensors, which is based on induced eddy effects, um, hall sensors are based on magnetic fields, so um, all of those different, or LVDTs, resolvers, so those can be modeled using Maxwell, as, Maxwell too. And um, another application area is for transformers or inductors, power electronics. So um, these transformers can be traditional transformers with a toroidal core, for example, or planar magnetics that goes on a PCB or it can be a wireless charging device. You can essentially view a wireless charging device as a large gap transformer. It's not a conventional transformer. So um, you can use Maxwell to model those, or even high power transformers, like the power distribution transformers, where um, uh, these are typically used in the distribution facilities. So um, you can model those as well using Maxwell. Other applications could be cables, for example. Um, if you have uh, cables that are carrying the power from, let's say, the motor to the battery, and you want to model those cables, um, then you can model those using Maxwell. Um, other applications could be trans uh, converters, or uh, if you have IGBT switches in your circuit, you can, uh, you can also model those switches using Simplural, for example. So let's go into electric vehicles um, from here on. So most of the industry now is focusing on electric electrification. So if you if you look at cars, you see more EVs on the road, more hybrid vehicles on the road. The future is going towards autonomous vehicles with self-driving. And what makes up a car an electric vehicle? There are several components in it. One is an electric machine, the motor, which is the center of it all, which basically drives the propulsion motor. And then there is a battery on board, if it's a hybrid. So this battery will be used in association with the motor to manage the, for the power management. And then there is a control system that would basically um, manage how the drive is operating and how the motor is operating. So there is a control system that is integral to it. And um, this control system, again, if there is a drive, the, 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 it's power electronics is an integral part of the drive, like the IGBTs, for example, switches, MOSFETs. So those are all part of the drive. And then how do you basically bring all of this together? So when, when I design the motor, I'm on the electromagnetics domain. When I design the battery, it's mostly electrochemistry fluids. And when I have the controls, it's talking another language. And when I have power electronics, it's basically switching, transition of the switches. How do I put this all together? And that is what basically the reduced order model or twin builder, ANSYS Simplorer and twin builder does, is it can bring the reduced order model from multiple physical domains, physics domains, into Simplorer, and you can build the whole system together there. So here is a good um, testimony from Lucid Motors. And let's take a look at this video here.
is moreover to create truly excellent world-class products. And the reason we can do that is because we have great confidence in the fidelity, the virtuosity of our computer. This is eloquent in our virtual prototypes at many many times over. And we can learn so much more from a computer prototype than a physical prototype. We are using as a great partner, great tools for engineering. Okay, so, so, so in that video from his testimony, we can see there are certain things why they are using simulation. One thing he mentioned there is the benefit of a virtual prototype. They can see a lot more in the simulation um, than, what they, than what they do in the physical prototyping stage. They can optimize their design just in simulation without having to create more and more prototypes and test it in the lab, which is which is um, time taking, painfully time taking. So you can lower your cycle time, you can reduce the time to market, you can reduce costs because now you're not building a prototype for every iteration of your design. Instead you're doing it in the simulation and you can see how you can improve the design by looking at some of the details like the field distribution and if you see, okay, it's getting saturated, I just switch the code to a different material. Um, or you change some parameters to overcome that problem. And so you can improve the increase of quality, you can eliminate risk, which is, which is more likely bound to happen with prototype. Um, and again, you can build out of the box, you can create new products, again you can manage, make, make it more complex, more complex systems, you can handle complex systems in simulation too. So also, um, you can do it in a step-by-step -step approach in simulation. Basically, you can start with a motor model, then you can add more complexity to it. So that way you can easily identify where, if there is a problem, where the problem is. So with the electric vehicle, again, we can see there are multiple things there, motor, battery, controls, um, electric pump. So each of these can, basically be a different physical domain. If it is a motor, then electromagnetics. I can use Maxwell to model the motor. Battery, when I'm designing by battery, I can use CFD to design the electrochemistry, assemble the batteries from cells, uh, the packs from cells, and use CFD to, uh, for my advantage there. And power electronics, I can use Simplorer or Twin Builder um, for power electronics modeling, and integrate that with controls in Simplorer too. So, it's basically, it's a complex of multi-physics. You're dealing with structural domains, you're dealing with motor cooling. So for example, in, in this case, Lucid case, we, see, we saw it's an induction motor, and induction motor typically at startup, there are high currents and it can heat up really quickly. So you can use uh, basically ANSYS CFD to cool, to see how you can cool it down using a liquid cooling or you know air cooling or some other type of cooling. And so it's basically multi-physics multi -physics as well as how do you integrate these multiple physics into one system. Um, and that can, that can be done using the ANSYS tools. So uh, when we look at this um, here, you, we can... Um, 
we can if we look on the right side there we can see there is a motor there is an inverter driving the motor and there is a bus bar between the bat, between the inverter and the motor and this inverter again is energized by a battery on board and now the motor uh, has some mechanical loads so that mechanical load is integrated there and there is an embedded software and a C code that would basically govern all of this, the switching and, and everything. So you can not only do the component level simulation, but you can do an entire system level simulation as well using uh, Simplorer. And uh, what else you can do is a hardware in the loop simulation. So you can generate a reduced order model um, or you can generate a C code and you can put it in the FP, on the FPGA and you can test out the code as well using scale. Uh, one other important, another important story here is about the battery and the thermal management. So what size, typically in electric vehicles there is a battery that would augment the motor. And what size battery should I use? How many cells? How many packs? Um, so you could basically use multi-scale, multi-dimensional model of the battery. You could use cooling channels to cool it down and you can also do uh, BMS, which is battery management. And you can basically see how the driving conditions would influence the state of charge of the battery. So if you are driving up the hill or driving down the hill, how would that battery discharge? Uh, for varying load conditions, so that can be done as well. And this is another nice story from Volkswagen. Um, this is for the Pike Speed Racing, and ANSYS collaborated with Volkswagen to basically design the battery for this case. Um, it's very challenging because the battery is only designed uh, to last for the for the run. So you, if you don't make it your loss. So basically, uh, it's a very challenging case. And there are some very interesting comments on this video, so let's take a look at this video. actually happened earlier this year. So that race happened earlier this year and let's take a look at some of the nice comments on this because it 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 kind of highlights what are the challenges um, in the previous video we saw it said certain altitude and it makes it more challenging because of the driving conditions from the design perspective from the EV design perspective why is it even more challenging so let's take listen to the comments on this video and it's it's very interesting Perfect. I agree this far. Uh, around about stars 2 at 1.9, and I think this size was quicker. And load was 1.8. I, I was very surprised to see that that number was reported as low as it was. My friend was to start very fast on the, on the <laughs> first sector. Yeah, that was from Leeds, but I didn't want to do it. He said, can I move it because there were a lot of people floating here, but more in Moscow. <laughs> and I was very scared that we couldn't be doing five speakers for this day. So then I said, okay, if you don't take any risk, don't do it in this for sure. That was my own target. Now it's time to 
work. Uh, slow down the brakes. So really one of the great advantages of the ground force is force the leg braking. And it's just free time uh, at that point. It really does pull out the horse incredibly fast. It, it was remarkable to see me go through the WZF. I've, I've been in Denny's race all my life and I've never seen anything quite cool like that. And there's so much dust on the road itself. During that sunrise, you can see that dust get kicked up here, and it really shows the influence of that zero dynamics, especially the under effects. Oh my gosh, why on coming into the golf park? I mean, it's so big. There's so much trust in the downforce there. there were uh, really some interesting comments. It's, an, it's a racing car. It's an electric car which races in very adverse conditions. And there were comments on the electric motor itself. It's a direct drive, uh, direct drive electric motor. And the challenges being that it needs to achieve a very high torque and give the maximum power to be able to uh, to drive the fast. And the I think one of the very interesting comments is the nine months to build. So nine months to build a racing car that beats the challenge. So how do you design faster? If you have to imagine if you have to build a prototype, change the prototype, manufacture it again, test it again, that nine months goal is kind of hard to achieve. It, um, it, it puts some very tight deadlines. So simulation basically is the way to go and you know you can basically iterate, iterate your design and look at the performance for different designs very quickly. So uh, for that case here basically um, ANSYS uh, collaborated with Volkswagen on the battery design for that, um, for the Pikes Peak Racing. And how is basically the battery basically designed is, I'm not going, going to go into specific details, but typically for electric vehicles, you would take battery cells, you would be, assemble those into modules, um, and then you would assemble the modules to make a battery pack. 
which basically then goes into the electric vehicle. So you could use um, CFD um, to basically build the battery. You could use a red, you could generate a reduced order model from CFD into uh, Simplorer, what is shown in the picture there, um, where it shows the circuit and system simulation. There you can see that you can assemble those uh, cells into modules and then modules into packs to see how it would uh, impact the driving conditions and how long it would last, for example. So most companies are basically headed towards the digital twin concept. Um, they would want to basically um, generate the design virtually, optimize the design virtually, and then once they find that optimal design, that's when they would go for the prototype. And um, you, could, you could basically uh, generate these models using reduced order models from the physics tool. Or you could just use ANSYS Simplorer Twin Builder to basically create uh, the model inside Simplorer. For example, on this slide here previously, you can see on the bottom of this slide, you can see that each cell, each battery cell, can be uh, approximated as a resistor and a capacitor connected together. So that would be an equivalent of a battery cell. So you could. You could go into the detail CFD or you could basically um, create a model from lumped components inside Simplorer and build the whole uh, battery pack as well. And um, you could also do some uh, battery life performance or predictive maintenance um, predictions as well using Simplorer for, for the battery packs. So uh, battery is one part, but then there is a power electronics. Um, Power electronics meaning the inverters or converters um, that, that basically go on board and cables that basically run throughout the throughout the vehicle. So you can um, or planar magnetics like transformers or inductors that would go um, into the system. So you can model all of them using Maxwell. You can redu generate a reduced order model or an equivalent circuit model into Simplorer from there as well. Another critical component here for electric vehicle is the electric machine design or the motor design. And in a little bit, actually, we'll go into the demo of the electric motors. So we can, um, I can open Maxwell and uh, and show the workflow for the electric motor there. And um, most of, so irrespective of the application, ANSYS Maxwell can be used for multi multi physics simulations. So be it motors or be it uh, transformers, wherever there are electromagnetic losses, be it induced losses or core losses like hysteresis losses, you can couple those losses from Maxwell into ANSYS mechanical um, and look at the temperature distribution there. Or you can couple them to CFD, you can impose cooling conditions and you can see how that influences the performance. So uh, once you basically uh, design the individual components, you can build the system um, from those components using Simplorer. You can take the models from your suppliers and you can basically uh, put them into Simplorer. So most answers um, like Maxwell or Simplorer, you can basically bring in your own models as well. So it, they come with their library. But if a component that you need is not in the library, you can import a controller model, or you can import a spice model, for example, in Simplorer. So um, here is um, some motor durability analysis. When we look at electric machine, so on the top here on this slide, where you see A, B, C, D blocks here, that is the workbench schematic, which enables multi-physics simulations. On the far leftmost of here block, the component A uh, shows Maxwell. And at the bottom here, you can see that Maxwell is computing the loss. And in workbench, there is a link between A and B. You can see the cell A4 is linked to B2. So you are basically taking the electromagnetic loss from Maxwell. You are imposing it as a load influent. 
and so Fluent can now predict the temperature based on the electromagnetic loss. So you can output the temperature from Fluent. And also um, there is a link to the structural domain there where Maxwell will compute the forces on each of the rotor or stator tooth tips and you can couple those forces into ANSYS structural to look at the deformation and you can basically um, use the acoustic uh, harmonic response solver there to see what is the noise it is generating within a room, for example. And you can predict the damage using ENCODE. So at each one of these designs, you will have different optimization parameters. So for electromagnetics, uh, when I'm looking at the motor alone, I may want to reduce my magnet size so I can save on the cost. I may want to have a small air gap to increase the torque. Or I, I, want to, I have different parameters that I want to optimize from an electromagnetic perspective. From fluent perspective, you may have different set of parameters. So my magnet dimensions probably would not matter much on the fluid side. I may, I may have a different set of parameters. So at each step of the design process and in each physics tool, you can run a parametric sweep. You can create your own parameters and you can basically do a parametric sweep and optimize your design from each perspective as well. So OptiSlang here is basically uh, an optimization tool um, ANSYS partners with OptiSlang for these goal-driven based optimization studies where if you have, let's say, 10 or 20 parameters that you want to optimize, it can uh, generate a, it can do a Pareto front analysis or it can generate a response surface for all those parameters. So for electric motors here, um, ANSYS methodology has different tools. Um, one is RM Expert, which is an analytical tool for electric machine design. And we will go, uh, after the slide, we'll go into a demo of uh, the electric motors. And Maxwell 2D or 3D is based on finite element analysis. The real advantage here is that once RM Expert is template based, you would choose a template for the rotor, you would choose a template for the stator, magnets, slots, and you would just define the dimensions in RM Expert. And it's because it's an analytical tool and based on equations, it will solve quickly and give you the performance of the machine. And what it can do at the end is it can generate a ready-to-run model into Maxwell 2D or 3D, where you can do a detailed finite element analysis. And you can use optimetrics. You can create variables and run an optimization study. You can use Simplorer to, for system level analysis. But if you want to integrate the drive with the motor, you can use Simplorer for there. And you can couple Maxwell with mechanical or CFD for thermal and structural response. So let's go into a demo of the tool here. So what I have opened here is electronics desktop. <coughs> so in the start menu, So based on the uh, release that is installed on the machine, you can launch electronics desktop from there. And this electronics desktop um, is the same installation if you are using HFSS or Maxwell or RM Expert. They're all bundled into the electronics desktop. So once you start the electronics desktop from here, it launches this window. And if I click on project now, I can see I have the option to insert a HFSS or a Maxwell 2D, Maxwell 3D, or RM Expert design. And for our session today, I think we are talking mostly about 3D Maxwell, 2D Maxwell, RM Expert, and we also talked about Simplor a little bit, which is basically renamed as Twin Builder here.
So if I choose insert RM expert design, we can see all the uh, machine types that are available with RM expert. So I can choose to insert a synchronous motor or a brushless DC motor. A uh, generic rotating machine could be an axial flux machine if you are looking to model an axial flux um, or double fed induction generator or uh, so the th in the induction machines three phase and single phase so you can see that you can design basically different machine types here in RM expert and if I choose one of these here let's say adjustable speed synchronous and click OK I can see here that it inserted the design in the project. And in the parenthesis here, it shows that this is an adjustable speed synchronous machine. And if I expand this machine, click on machine, I can, in the properties window at the below here, I can specify the number of poles. If it is an inner rotor type or an outer rotor type of motor, the frictional loss and windage loss, these are the mechanical losses. So you can specify any reference speed at which you have measured the mechanical losses and you can input those loss numbers here. So these will go into the efficiency computation. So for the uh, electric machine, its efficiency is power out by power in and this uh, mechanical loss will be factored into that computation. And we can choose the control type as DC, AC, or PWM. And we can choose how, uh, if I click on the circuit type, I can choose how my machine windings are connected in the drive. If it is a star type, or a Y type, or a delta type, or you know, other uh, loop type, or other configurations. So uh, now if I click on stator here, I can define my stator dimensions. The outer diameter of the stator, the inner diameter, the length of the stator, the stacking factor. The stacking factor is used for lamination, so if you have a laminated stator, then um, you can define the stacking factor there. If it is not laminated, if it is a solid stator, you can just leave it as zero for solid. And steel type, if you click on the steel type button here, it will take you to the material library. And in the material library, you can see that there are several uh, vendor libraries already available. We can see this is the permanent magnet library from ordinal magnetics. And for several grades of Olnico magnets or neodymium magnets, and the material properties are all defined. For these permanent magnets, if I choose view edit materials, here I have the BH curve for that material. And there is a China steel library, soft steels, and we have Hitachi metals for soft steels again, Japan steel, and there is a Shinetsu library for permanent magnets, vacuum smells, TDK. So there are several libraries that basically get installed with Maxwell. If you have a material that is not in here, then you can also uh, just define your own material. You can add material and you can define your own material properties, create your own custom library as well. Okay, so uh, the number of slots, the slot type, so if I click on the slot type here, it opens the templates for the slot shapes. So I can choose a slot shape from here. Or I also have an option to define a user-defined slot. And if I choose a user-defined slot, I can basically build my own slot shape using the segments from, from ARM Expert. And if, it, if there is a skew, you can specify a skew width. So you can define the slot parameters, the winding distribution, the number of winding layers, the number of conductors per slot, the coil pitch, and so on. So in the same way for the rotor as well, you can define the dimensions for the rotor. And for the pole, um, 
let me go back here for rotor and for rotor for the pole type if I click on the pole type you can see the options to define the rotor how the permanent magnets if it is an interior permanent magnet type or a surface permanent magnet type or a bread loaf type of magnet you can choose a configuration from here and then you can define the uh, dimensions of the magnet of the pole here so for the, for today's session let's use an installation example the best way to get started with rm expert or machine design in maxwell uh, is to use look at to refer to some installation examples if you click on file in your men, in the menu bar um, i can choose open examples and it takes me to the installation library and in here i can choose rm expert folder and we can see that there are subfolders for each machine type which is axial flux permanent magnet motor uh, synchronous machines bldc uh, dc motors induction machine single phase three phase um, in interior permanent magnet motors so there are examples that are ready to run that came with your in with the installation so let me go with this axial um, adjustable speed synchronous machine it's a pmsm you can choose the first example or let's choose any um, example and if i click on open now it basically opens that um, that 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 project here And if you are using an installation example, my first suggestion would be to save it in a different folder so you are not modifying the installation copy. So I would typically do save as. And I would just create a new folder. Save it there. So this installation example, as you can see, it has four poles. It's an inner rotor type of motor. It has, um, if I click on the stator here, I can see that it has 24 slots on this machine. Now, let me just take a look at the winding configuration. If you click on winding under stator, you can see it's a two layer winding. Um, and if you right click on a slot, you can just choose connect all coils or connect one phase coils in reality the coils are always connected in the background this would just turn on the display so you can just visually verify how the windings are connected okay if i just want to visualize just one phase uh, i can just right click and say connect one phase coils so that is how my phase a coils are connected between the slots my winding is distributed so Again, to visualize that, you can just right click and say connect one phase coil. And in the analysis setup, we can see that this machine operates at a rated output power of 550 watts, a rated voltage of 220 volts and 1500 RPM. You can also specify an operating temperature here. And I'm just going to leave the parameters as is for now. But uh, let's go ahead and analyze it. Once you run the analysis, you can see that it went by very quickly. And because this is an analytical tool, 
and it solves the equations in the background, it solves very quickly. <coughs> Now, if I right-click on results here, I can choose solution data. And if I click on the curves tab here, I can see <clears throat> the efficiency of the machine. The cogging dot. the air gap flux density winding currents the winding voltages so um, the torque coefficient for example <clears throat> so you can see here that um, all the performance data of the machine is available very quickly in the analytical solution and if I go to the design sheet here, I can also look at the comprehensive design data of my machine, including the sizing, the output parameters, and so on. <coughs> so here, for the cogging torque, you can see there is a cogging torque value here. The efficiency of the machine the iron losses, core losses and copper losses. So all of the machine performance data is reported here. And the similar data is available here, but you can basically choose by category and you can look at D-axis, Q-axis parameters, LDL, Q and so on from, from this window here. And if you are basically very early on in your design stage and you're trying to optimize the dimensions, you can just click on any, um, any uh, parameter here. For example, if I click on pole, I can create a parameter for the magnet thickness. I can just type it as a variable name. I can just say this is some arbitrary variable name. So let's say 3.5 mm is my nominal value. And if I click on my design name now, I can see that variable created. If I change this variable, you can see that the dimension changes graphically here in this window. And you can uh, also set up a parametric sweep. If I right click here, Optimetrics, Add Parametric, and Add. So I can say I want to sweep the magnet thickness from, let's say, 3 millimeters to 3.5 millimeters. And in steps of, let's say, 0.1 millimeter. So I can basically create a parametric sweep, and I can run that parametric sweep and visualize the results for each variation. So how is my torque changing if my magnet thickness is 3 versus 3.5? How is the efficiency changing if it is 3.1 versus 3.4? So all the performance data is available for each of the design variations. So let's say I can basically create any number of parameters in the design. So not just the magnet thickness, I can change the outer diameter, I can create a variable for the inner diameter of the stator. So all of those can be parameterized and you can have any number of parametric sweeps within a given design. Okay, so let me, I have invalidated the results here, let me just read on it quickly. So right click on choose and lives. And this is all with an ORM expert, so we are still using the analytical equations to solve this motor in ORM expert. And now I can right click on setup one and choose create Maxwell design. And I can choose if I want to create a 2D or a 3D design. Okay, if I choose for example 3D design and click OK. So what it does is it basically invokes Maxwell 
It generates a geometry into Maxwell. It sets up the material properties. It, ha it creates the winding. It creates the excitations for the winding. And it basically gives you a ready to run motor. So it's an automated way of creating your motor design into Maxwell. So now, um, if I just close this window here, in the same project, I can see there is a Maxwell 3D design added within that same uh, tree here. And we can see it created a Maxwell design. And if you look at um, this history here, So we can see it created the windings and it assigned copper to the windings. I have the rotor and stator. The steel is assigned on the rotor and stator. The material property is already set up based on what I chose in Orm Expert. And it has set up the magnets. So one question that may come up here is why isn't there a full 360 degree model when my Orm Expert is a 360 degree model? So when RM Expert by default sets up the model, it identifies the least symmetric, least periodic structure, and then creates the model for the least periodic structure. So that way you can save your simulation time, uh, run it more efficiently, very quickly. And um, also here we can see it has set up a band or a motion setup, and it has assigned the speed on the rotor to be 1500 RPM. And um, also in the same dialogue here, um, it has set up an initial position. This initial position is aligned such that there is maximum flux linkage within phase A. So basically, RM Expert computes what this angle should be. So it, it achieves the maximum flux linkage in phase A. And um, also it has set up, since now we have just a 45 degree model. And if you notice this geometry, it's not only 45 degree model, but it has also split it along the length of the shaft. So it's basically one eighth of the model because it has sliced it um, along the Z axis and then it has uh, split it into one quarter. So it's basically a one, one eighth uh, structure model. And for this, it has assigned the master slave boundaries to indicate periodicity in fields that was automated. And we can see here there are three phase windings assigned on copper. And it has also set up this external circuit. And these inductors here basically corresponds to those three phase windings. So it has set up the sources, it has set up the drive circuit, the switching schematic, and everything. And now at this point, it's basically a ready-to-run model. You can just right-click on the setup and, and analyze, and it should run the analysis. So um, I have run this model ahead of time. And I have run it in 2D, so I can basically just open this pre-run model and share the results with you. So one other um, thing here is that you can have RM Expert generate the Maxwell design. And now let's say you are designing an unconventional motor. You can just switch out the rotor. Let's say you have a different rotor shape. Um, then you can just delete the rotor that RM Expert generated, import your own rotor geometry from SolidWorks or any other um, CAD model that you have, and just rerun it with a new rotor. So. Um, you can directly start in Maxwell. You can import your whole motor geometry directly into Maxwell without having to deal with RM Expert. Run directly in Maxwell. Or uh, you can find a closer template in RM, RM Expert. Let it do all the setup work for you. And once you are in Maxwell, you can just switch the rotor or stator with your custom geometry 
and, uh, and run the analysis too. So once that Maxwell design is generated, it's completely independent. It, any changes that you make to Maxwell design will not go back into RM Expert. So it's completely independent and you, you have the full control of it. So you can make changes in any way you want to. So this is a 2D design. I have just run this in 2D. And um, also these results, the reports are automatically set up by RM Expert too. But if you want to create them on your own, it should be quite simple to do. You can just right click on create transient report, rectangular plot. And here I can choose moving torque and I can basically plot this same torque versus time. And if I go for position, I can plot position of the rotor versus time or winding and I can plot the inductances. So here we can see the quantities which is, uh, this is self-inductance of phase A mutual inductances between phase A and phase B, uh, and flux linkages of each phase, the induced voltages or back EMFs, so I can choose any quantity that I want from this window and I can click on new report to create these XY plots. So all the quantities are really available directly, so you don't have to really ex uh, extract these results, that they are automatically reported by Maxwell. And these are my three phase windings. The induced voltages, flux linkages, LDLQ, D axis and Q axis inductances, DQ flux linkages, and IDIQ. DQ axis currents. And I can also plot uh, the field distribution. So if I go back to this window here, I can double click on this B field plot and this dis displays the flux density distribution. And to create, if you are looking to create this field plot, it's quite simple to do. What I'm doing here is I would just right click on sheets, select all, and I would just select fields, A flux lines, or B magnitude of B which is flux density, or vector plot. So it reports the current density distribution, the flux density distribution, the field intensities, the flux lines. So let me just choose, and if I choose other, we can see here it also reports the core loss, ohmic loss, so if you are looking to compute hysteresis losses or winding losses, you can also use these quantities and plot them on the, on the objects. So let me choose A, flux lines. And if I click on done, it basically shows this flux line, uh, the flux loops here. Let me do this. If I want to increase the density, I can change the number of divisions here. And we can see more dense flux lines here. So um, looking at this flux density distribution, this is a motor application, but if, if you are doing an inductor or transformer or even a wireless charging device, it's the same way that you can create a flux density plot. And looking at this plot, this can give you an idea of if your core is getting saturated. For example, in this core, I can see, um, in this picture here, I can see the stated flux density distribution, and I can see that the highest flux density is about 1.6 Tesla. Now, if I go back to my material properties, right click on my stator material properties, and choose view edit materials, I have the BH curve for stator. And here I can see that it saturates somewhere sl uh, slightly below two Tesla. So I can see that uh, in this case my stator is not yet saturated, so I have still some room for operation. So you can basically, um, looking at these flux density maps, you can get an idea if the core is saturated uh, in any application, basically. And I can right click on this, um, let me hide the flux line. 
I can right click on Mac B plot and I can choose animate and I can animate it versus time to see how the flux density changes as the rotor rotates in time. So in this case, there are, uh, it's a very dynamic situation because the rotor, uh, the stator currents, the winding currents change in time. We have a time dependent excitation and the, not only the winding currents, but the rotor is also rotating in time. So the flux density is very dynamically changing because the flux linkage is changing and the, kind, the winding currents are changing in time. to Maxwell, going from RM expert to Maxwell. You can also do the same type of analysis in 3D. Um, now, would I choose a 2D or a 3D analysis for this machine? I would typically go with 2D, but if my end windings are large, that I expect some end winding losses, then I would need a 3D to capture that end winding losses, because in 2D, I'm not, I'm not able to model the end windings in 2D. So, there are instances where you may need a full 3D model if you are looking into some detail there. Okay, and uh, I see we are down to the last 10 minutes of this presentation. So I will just go into one more application um, details, but um, you can do much more for the motors like multi-physics analysis. So let me just cover this one slide. So what we have seen so far is there is this uh, experts block on the right side, on the right bottom um, of the screen, sorry, on the left bottom of the screen, the expert block, where it shows generator design and power electronics design. So that is what we called as RM expert. We started there. And then um, there is a link here to the Maxwell design. So we started here on the expert block and we generated a Maxwell design from RM expert. And our Maxwell is calculating the performance of the machine. It is also giving out the losses. It is computing the torque. The torque is basically derived from the force. So it's basically computing the force density, it's computing the losses. So I can then take the losses into ANSYS Mechanical, which, is, which has a thermal solver and I can compute the loss distribution there. So what can be done is you can see this is a two-way arrow, meaning that you can not only couple the loss from Maxwell to thermal, but you can pass the temperature distribution back to Maxwell. So what you can do in Maxwell is you can make the material properties as temperature dependent. So I can say in real world, the conductivity of copper changes with temperature. So as the temperature increases, it becomes more resistive. So that you can expect more losses. So you can make the material properties as temperature dependent in Maxwell. And when you feed the temperature back from thermal to Maxwell, it will recalculate the losses at that temperature. So you can, in about three to four iterations between both tools, you can see that the loss and the temperature converges to a number. So you can say that's how hot the machine can get or how high the losses can go. And in a similar way, you can do a two-way coupling with, between Maxwell and CFD. So CFD is typically used if you have external flow conditions that is cooling down the motor, like a forced air cooling or a liquid cooling that is cooling down the motor. So if you want to um, impose those flow conditions, then you can use fluent for, for, the, for those cases. And it's also a bidirectional link between fluent and Maxwell. So you can also feed the temperature back from fluent into Maxwell. And also, um, there is a link to structural or stress solver in mechanical. So Maxwell is computing the force density. And let's say, depending on the conditions, there may be eccentricity in the motor, which can cause an imbalance in the forces on the stator toothpicks. 
So in that case, there may be some deformation. So you can basically transfer the force density into structural, look at the deformation, look at the acoustics there. You can map the deformed mesh back into Maxwell and see how that influences the torque of the machine because of a non-uniform air gap, for example. So, um, and what else we can do here is we can take all the reduced torque models into Simplorum. So you can see that with Simplorum, there are arrows from almost every block into Simplorum. So you can take a reduced order model from Maxwell that basically characterizes the machine into Simplorer. Or you can do a co-simulation between Maxwell and Simplorer. You can take a thermal model from mechanical into Simplorer or from CFD into Simplorer. And you can build the whole system in Simplorer. And Simplorer has a library of components for uh, IGBT switches, resistors, inductor sources. So you can build your drive in Simplorer uh, by taking all the reduced order models from each of these tools here. And I just want to cover one more application before we end our session today is, and one other thing here is um, if you are interested in further reading about the multiphysics analysis, there is a uh, book that was published towards the end of last year. Um, and this goes into more details on finite element modeling and uh, uh, multiphysics analysis. So that would be a good read as well if you would like to um, dig further into these tools. So uh, let me go a little bit into uh, wireless charging. So Maxwell can be used for several application areas. One of those is wireless charging. So with the future headed towards electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Again, this is going to be part of the integral solution for electric vehicles is the capability to wirelessly charge um, the car. You can currently see it for some of the consumer electronics like phones, for example, and it can be used for those cases as well. Um, and Maxwell can basically model the inductive coupling um, or the wireless charging. So what is happening here is there is a transmitting coil and there is a receiving coil uh, with the wireless charger. So what you would want to see is basically the coupling between these coils. How would the coupling change? What is the efficiency of the wireless charger? How would the coupling change if these coils are not perfectly aligned or if one of the coils is slightly um, sliding away, then how would the um, how would the efficiency change? So we can use Maxwell to model those. Depending on the um, type of wireless charging and depending on the transfer distance, it can be either Maxwell or HFSS. So let's say if you have inductive type of coupling, Maxwell can model the inductive type of coupling. But if you have microwave type of uh, coupling at radio frequencies, then you would use ANSYS HFSS um, for such uh, design. And it depends on the transfer distance. Typically at uh, smaller transfer distances, you would have, you can use Maxwell, but if it is a long range like antenna design, then you would use HFSS for those cases. Okay, and um, This is a simple example of a wireless charger. You can model that with a lumped element. Uh, inside Simplorer, you can just take a lumped inductor and um, you can model this uh, wireless charging in Simplorer. But then again, um, in reality, this transmitter and receiver is a, some sort of a spiral coil. There is a, you would want to, as a, if you're designing a wireless charging device, you would want to model, change the number of turns or you'd want to change the transfer distance and see how the performance changes. So Maxwell will give you the capability to change the number of turns, change the current in the coil, change the distance between the coils, and uh, look at the performance in each case. So, um, and what Maxwell reports in this case it can, is it can give you an inductance matrix and on the right bottom, Sorry, on the left bottom corner, you can see there is an inductance matrix 
the diagonal terms are self inductances and the off diagonal terms are the mutual inductances you can model saturation just like i mentioned earlier for the for the electric motor um you can see where that operating fo point falls along the bh curve and model saturation and you can basically parameterize the distance between the receiver and transmitter and um you can see how the inductance changes as these coils move away or as they slide off and you can model shielding so that's one common concern is you would want to contain the fields not leak out and uh cause some induced eddy currents in other devices so you can add some shields and see how the flux if the shield is being effective or not so that's a very quick overview but let me show you a workbench here um so in this case this is what, where i was talking about multi physics simulations coupling different physics taking the loss from maxwell into ansys mechanical and do a couple analysis so this um block here is my maxwell model and if i double click on this cell it opens my maxwell project which is basically a spiral it's like an induction heating or if you imagine basically the receiver or transmitter of the wireless charger i have a spiral coil and a ferrite sheet below the coil so we can model the induced steady currents so as you can see here um i have a copper coil which is carrying 125 amp current in that spiral and it's a sinusoidal current at 500 hertz and there is a iron disk below the coil which can have some eddy currents because of the magnetic flux from the coil so maxwell is basically giving me this loss distribution in the disk so this is the induced eddy loss in the disk and when coupled to mechanical i can look at the temperature distribution in ansys mechanical So if I double click on this resource cell it opens mechanical and if I look at this imported load here this imported load is coming from Maxwell So this loss is computed in Maxwell as 270 watts on the disk which is assigned as a load in mechanical and this will be the temperature distribution because of the electromagnetic loss so you can do a couple analysis so that you're modeling your exact geometry between different physical domains um instead of approximating with a lump number so you can see here the loss distribution is not uniform um throughout the disk so this workbench is easier to adopt if you are using any of the ansys tools so this is a blank workbench schematic and i can basically drag a maxwell component and i can dra drag a thermal component now if i want to link the geometry between the two all i need to do is drag this b a2 cell and drop it on b3 and my geometry is transferred to mechanical and if i want to map the solution drag the a4 cell and drop it on b5 and that takes the loss into mechanical so it's re really easy to adopt if you are doing multi physics simulation uh, going from one physics domain to other is it's really made easier with the workbench so uh that i think is what i want had for most of the session today but uh to conclude we can see that uh no matter what physics you want to model be it structural or thermal or electromagnetics ansys has a solution for each physics domain 
and it can model a complete electric vehicle, including the battery, drive, uh, motor, power electronics, and everything. Um, and not only that you are doing multi-physics, but you can model a whole system, generate reduced order models from each physics domain, and take it into simpler and build the whole system in simpler too. So um, I would let my colleague uh, conclude here. Yeah, she did a wonderful job, huh? Yeah, one more time, right? Like two hours of that? Hey. Uh, for those of you in the room, thank you for joining. Thanks for your enthusiasm and learning answers today. Those on the live stream, same to you. I hope, uh, I hope you got a lot out of this. And uh, you, if you want to learn more, you know, again, the resources from Arizona State University, uh, that's air dash uh, simulation or air x simulation. Uh, take a Google for that. And, and also take, check out Kami RK's YouTube channel too and, and our tips and tricks channel. Um, and we'll hope to see you Thursday for our CFD webinar and next week for mechanical and high frequency uh, with autonomous systems. Thanks and have a good evening. Uh, hey, hey if, uh, if anyone in the room